the name of the game is Controlling Your Robot. Uh, let me just find my note screen. There we go. So um, we had a look before at using feed forward to try and improve less than stellar controllers, um, which, to my mind, immediately begged the question, what constitutes a, a, a less than stellar controller, but which is also um, adequate for the job at hand? And there are... There's no end of possible control schemes available to you to control your robot. Um, and even when you've decided how you want to do this, you have to, uh, and, and gone into the whole business of exactly what it is you're going to control and how it's going to be controlled and all of the other things, um, inevitably uh, you come up against the question of how do you tune your controller. And tuning is, is the term people use, which um, is not, um, a, a great term, but it's it's what people say, right? It implies it's like a you know, musical instrument where it's all set up and you just have to get it all tweaked just right. And today, um, what I want to have a look at is, first of all, we'll go over a little bit about the um, characteristics of the system and the responses, um, just a, a bit of a refresher. We'll have a look at how we're going to implement some kind of closed loop control and, and what kind of benefits you can expect to get from it. We're going to have a look at how you tune or how you might try and set up that controller to give you a specific um, set of uh, outcomes. Uh, and then we're going to have a look at how you can eliminate, hopefully, all of that, that tedious and potentially dangerous tuning activity uh, and replace it with some relatively simple calculations that should let you get right on with the job and make what um, I have variously called a quick and dirty controller or a just good enough controller. Think of it like just in time delivery, but for controllers. So the first step is to characterize the drive system. And uh, we went through this once before, but um, we'll, we'll just go through it again. And note that the um, we're going to be using DC motors to drive uh, a wheeled mobile, ro wheeled mobile robot. And for the sake of simplification, we'll use a unicycle type model where we're just talking about a motor, a wheel, uh, and you're going to move it <clears throat> at varying speeds and to position your robot where you want it to go. And we have to note something about this drivetrain, or a few things about this drivetrain. First of all, the applied voltage determines the speed at which the motor will go. If we wish to accelerate the motor, and thus the robot, we need to apply some current. Um, if the load changes, um, we need to change the current if we want to keep the speed constant. It's all this interaction going on. One way or another, though, the motor drive system is a simple first-order system. Um, and if you've done anything in electronics, you'll be familiar with first-order systems. These are, for example, the charge and discharge rate of capacitors. They follow a very basic um, exponential rule. Um, and there are two constants which define these first-order systems. One is the overall gain. So if you put one volt in, how many millimeters per second do you get out of it, or uh, how many revs per minute, or whatever it is, your unit might be. And the other is the system time constant, which is how long it takes um, to, to get to some fraction of the, of the final value. Um, these are very, very common um, kinds of systems. All sorts of things follow these rules. Um, and if you want, if you're not happy with the robot thing, or if you're not happy with the capacitors, something which is more intuitive perhaps is maybe applying currents to a heating element for a soldering iron or a hot plate or your cooker or something like that. Okay. So you might start off by applying a step change um, in the current to the uh, heater or to the voltage to a motor at time zero. Um, and you can see that as the blue line on here. And then over time, the output, the temperature, the speed, whatever it is that you're measuring, 
will climb slowly towards some final value. Now, I've shown the blue line um, as going up to the same to the final value, but of course, you know, you might put in one volt and get out of it 240 revs per minute or something like that. So this is this is merely uh, showing what the expected step response is. So we see the gain, uh, which we'll refer to uh, again and again today as, as Km. And we'll see the time constant, Tm. The time constant is defined here as the time taken for the output to reach 63% of its final steady state value, 63% give or take. It's, it's 1 minus e to the minus 1. Um, and a good rule of thumb is that uh, it will take four time constants to get to about 95% of the final value and five time constants to get to about 99%. Uh, of the final value, but within ninety, within five percent of the final value in four time constants, All right? So we can do an experiment, uh, and we can apply voltages um, to uh, a motor. Oh no! Uh, let me let's try that again. Sorry, um, I can't see what's going on on the Zoom call, so I don't know what's. Right. Um, and what we get is a series of outputs. So here I have an experimental setup. I've applied a, a, a number of fixed voltages between one and six volts to a motor, and I have measured the speed of the output. Um, I have incorrectly shown the units as millimeters per second, but you'll see in a moment it's actually degrees per second. And it should be apparent that in all cases, the output reaches some final steady state value after a certain amount of time. Um, and the spacing between those lines looks to be fairly even, which implies that there is a linear relationship between the applied voltage and the final steady state value. Not very clearly shown on here is um, uh, a curve calculated in the spreadsheet um, and drawn underneath the experimental values. Uh, and that curve is, the, is uh, described by the exponential equation on the right there. So this is my model. The solid curve, which you can't see, uh, is the model of the motor. And the somewhat scratty lines are the experimental data. Um, and the, the point perhaps is just to show that the real data coming from a real system is a very, very good fit for this model. Uh, and so my model is a, is a valid description of the system. And it is determined by just two constants. Um, the time constant we could um, work out by just having a look at the steady state value here um, and go and find out where it the data gets to around about 60% of that. To find the gain, um, the easiest thing to do is to simply take those final steady state values, plot them on a graph, join them up, and get the slope of that line, uh, and that will give us our Km. And for this particular model, um, Km, the gain, turns out to be 2064.7. Um, he says with optimistic precision, um, degrees per second, per volt. Um, uh, we'll just, for later purposes, we'll just remind ourselves that this line does not go through zero because um, mechanical um, constraints mean that you need a little bit of voltage just to get things moving. So let's do an experiment. Um, and I'll switch over to the experiment, which I hope you can all see. Um, and what we have here is, in the top right, a picture of a motor system. Um, I'll just move the camera around. What it is, in fact, is uh, a standard UK Mars bot. I've disconnected the onboard motors 
uh, and connected them to getting me own lights here. Connected them up to another motor, same kind, uh, and I've connected that motor to uh, a large wheel. Uh, and the wheel um, has some weights in it, and I've set it up so that it has approximately the same inertia as the robot itself. So that is to say, it represents a similar load to the robot. So the results you see, you see should be um, reasonably comparable to those that you would get from running the robot itself. So one of the things that we can do, um, I have an app uh, which I've written, which talks to the robot, um, and we'll just um, call that up on my screen. So I can, I'll just reset everything. And I can do the system identification. Here I'm only doing one voltage. I'm going to apply three volts to the motor and have it spin up um, until it reaches steady state, uh, and then I can examine the response and just verify that I've, I've actually got um, something sensible um, going on here. And if I zoom in, you can see that the final steady state is somewhere around 5,800 degrees per second, and 63% um, of that is about 3,600 and we cross 3,600 in a little over 300 milliseconds, right? So I have a gain um, of just over 2,000. It's actually slightly under when you calculate it this way, but, but re recall you need a series to get the gain properly. Uh, and I have a time constant of 0.325, millisec uh, 0.325 seconds. And these numbers you can see down here, the robot has those stored in them. This code, the basic code, by the way, is just UK Marsbot Maze Runner code. It's, it's the same stuff, but with just uh, an adaptation to let me talk to it over the PC. Um, so we'll just set that back. Now, we saw in a previous talk that once you have these constants, you can try to drive the motor knowing something about how it should respond. So I have set up on here the speed feed forward, which you calculate from the gain, the acceleration feed forward, and the, that bias value, right? The, the amount of voltage that's needed to just make it move at all. Um, we'll just send that off to the robot to be sure that it's there. And we're gonna run a profile using only open loop control, feed forward control. And you can see that I get my green line here is what the profile should look like. It's supposed to be doing four rotations at up to 3,600 degrees per second. And the solid blue line is what it actually managed. And it's, it's had a fair old try, right? It's not done too badly. Uh, my calculations are reasonably good. The upper graph shows in orange what's actually being sent to the motor. Underneath that, hidden, because it's the same thing, is the, the feed-forward drive voltage. Uh, and shown here dotted, because it, the controller is not active, is the voltage coming from the controller that we're going to describe later. So this is the basic kind of lab setup, and I can run this any number of times and get slightly different results. And if you have a look, I've got a little pointer on here so you can see when it's done uh, the, the proper amount. Um, a thing to bear in mind, by the way, is that the, um, the drive system is um, it's adequate for the job the robot was designed to do, but in terms of um, global quality, uh, it leaves a little to be desired, right? So you've got a, a, twin, a 12 count per revolution encoder, you've got a 20 to 1 gearbox, and it, that means that the very, the absolute resolution that can be achieved is only about three degrees. So you can expect just one count to move the motor 
the output rotor this much, right? And I point this out just so that I can show off later. Um, and if we run it, well, it's not terrific, but, you know, it's not bad. I've seen worse. If I reduce the drive voltage, uh, which I do on my power supply, it's currently at 7 volts, so I'm going to turn it down to just 5 volts and run it again. It still works, because remember, inside the maze runner code, we compensate for the supply voltage. So if it asks for 5 volts, it gets 5 volts, so long as there's 5 volts available. It's a, a point worth bearing in mind for later. Just turn that back up. <laughs> Because this is open loop, it has it's not good at dealing with problems. We can deal with the, the, the supply voltage by compensating uh, for what we measure from the battery. But if I apply a scientifically calibrated load with a cotton bud um, and run it again, you can guess what's going to happen, right? It never gets up to speed. It's friction. This is just like having a robot drive uphill or, as happened to me once just before a competition, uh, to get a long hair wrapped around the drive axle. Um, and things don't go well. So this, this it's not good at compensating for disturbances or changes in the load or, or any of those kinds of things. So if we... Uh, move on from there. In order to, to get full control of the system, we need some kind of closed loop feedback system. And here um, I'm going to be implementing a PD controller. You've come across PID controllers um, for reasons that um, we can discuss at another on another occasion over a beer. You don't need the item for this particular kind of controller, so we just deal with PD. In general, um, if you just if you don't have to have a long-term um, zero error, and if you're using something like position, PD is adequate. If you do have to eliminate long-term errors and offsets, or if you're dealing with a speed control, which this isn't, I know it looks like it, but it isn't then a PI controller, was, you're going to need the I term, right? But for our purposes, we only need the PD terms. So we can draw a little block diagram, uh, and we can have the system itself, which we know something about, and some magical bit of software or electronics, um, which will have a look at the error between the difference between what we want the output to be, the set point, and what it actually is, the output, yt. And it will have a look at that error, and it will generate a signal based upon that error to try and drive the system to the right place. And the benefits that you get from this are you can compensate for uh, systematic errors. So if I design a system um, and set it up right, and you go and you implement it, on um, your robot, but your robot's got a slightly different, you know, motor characteristic or whatever. I don't want yours to behave horribly differently just because your motor is slightly different or your wheels are slightly out or whatever. So I want to try and get rid of those kinds of things. I also want to be able to um, remove the effect of disturbances. Um, so, you know, if I'm driving uphill or downhill, I don't really want it to suddenly go slower or not go as far as it should do or, or have any of these other kinds of upsets. And also, think back a moment to the first order response, right? So this has got um, a time constant of 0.325 seconds. And if I just applied a voltage and allowed the thing to wind itself up to speed on its own, using that kind of response, it would take four time constants to get to within 5% of the set point. Well, that's 1.2 seconds. I was watching videos of the um, recent student micromouse 
contest in Japan the other day, um, and their half-sized mice, mice on 16 by 16 maze were running the whole damn course in two seconds. You can't be waiting 1.2 seconds for it to just wind itself up to speed and decide what to do. You need better performance. So we can write um, equations which describe the system. These are transfer functions. Um, I have no idea how many of you are familiar with transfer functions. Wave a hand if you understand anything at all about transfer functions in the S domain. Right, okay. So um, it's magic. That's the most important thing to remember. There is magic which lets you describe dynamic systems in terms of complex numbers, the square root of minus one, and frequencies and, and, and other such nonsense. Uh, and better people than you and I have worked out how to use these things, uh, uh, allowing you to mostly um, plug in the answers. But here, in these transfer functions, S is um, a function of frequency. Uh, and you can think of it as a time delay as also. Uh, it depends on your perspective. So the PD controller has two constants, KP and KD. Right? These determine its behavior. They determine everything about it. The system itself already has two constants that we've seen before. Km is the gain, and Tm is the rise time, the, the, the time constant of the first order response. Now, through the magic of mathematics, we can uh, write down an expression which describes the output in terms of the set point and the error. And that looks like that. I expect you're thrilled. Um, so uh, for those of you who don't have uh, a, a background in these things, this looks like you've already hit an insurmountable obstacle and, and you're, you're ready to give up. So what do you do? Well, it turns out that these kinds of systems where you're feeding back um, a first order system and an integrator, which is what how we get the distance out of the, the speed, are generically called second order systems. And these are very well understood, at least in the control theory domain, they're very well understood. You and I may not have a thorough understanding of them, but you know that there are techniques and there's no end of literature in fact if you go and pick up any book on control systems i pretty much guarantee that three quarters of it is going to be about handling second order systems because even when you have much more complicated systems people love to try and simplify them down into second order systems so that they can use these well-established techniques if they fail then by all means make life more difficult for yourself but if you can make it work with just a second order standard system, life is good. Now, these systems have two defining characteristics. One is the damping ratio, zeta, written with this annoying, annoyingly hard to write Greek letter. Uh, and the other is the natural frequency. You can think of the natural frequency as being like the bandwidth of the system, uh, and you can think of it as determining the rise time, right? The time it takes to get from zero up to some particular set point. And these, um, these values appear um, in this equation, and we'll see how in a moment. They're not there, right? But we'll, we'll see where they come from in a moment. So if second order systems are well understood, um, what, how do they respond, right? We've had a look at first-order systems, and they, they seem pretty straightforward, right? Sluggish, but straightforward. Second-order system is somewhat more complicated. If we take a normalized, generic second-order system and apply a step input to it, you can get all sorts of different outputs. And the values of the damping ratio, zeta, and the bandwidth, omega, will affect that. So here I've plotted changes only in the damping ratio. They have the same, this is a normalized system, it's not a real system, 
Um, uh, so the, the bandwidth is the same, but I've changed the damping ratio. And you can see that for small values of the damping ratio, you get an oscillatory response, which dies away. And that inevitably means that there will be some overshoot. For large values, you can see that you get a more gradual climb up to the steady state. And it's important to note that you always do get this steady state, right? For the systems that we're talking about, this will always converge on some steady state. There are some interesting values uh, of note for zeta, which are always good to kind of keep in the back of your mind. One is uh, zeta equals one. This is so-called critical damping, and it's the value, the largest value, sorry, the smallest value, which means there is no overshoot. And a value of 0.7, or 0.707, um, more accurately, is uh, another interesting value. It's the value which um, perhaps most quickly gets you to within 5% of your target, right? This 5% we were talking about before. It's also numerically convenient because it's um, half the square root of two, and that, that makes some calculations easier a bit later. So that's if we change the damping ratio. What if we keep the damping ratio the same, but change the bandwidth, the frequency of the whole thing? Um, and what that does is change the settling time. So these responses all have uh, uh, a damping ratio of 0.5, but they've got different bandwidths. And the system with the highest bandwidth, the green one, shoots up fastest and gets to within 5% quickest. And the other will take considerably longer. Right? So this is not by way of trying to uh, get you to understand anything deep about second order systems. The purpose here is simply to show you that there are two key parameters that define the behavior of the system the damping ratio and the bandwidth. Unfortunately, they interact. So changing one tends to affect the other. But don't worry, not going to be a problem. So step responses are all very well. But they're not much use to us for robots. If you're designing a hot plate to, for doing some reflow soldering, terrific. OK, you can apply a voltage, uh, uh, change the set point, sorry, in your controller. You can measure the temperature. You can see the kinds of responses that we've got. And you can plan to have a particular amount of overshoot or no overshoot. And you can adjust the bandwidth to get the rise time. And you can, you can tart around until you get a nice response. But that's not how we drive robots. Nobody in their right mind moves a robot from here to 200 millimeters away by suddenly setting a new set point of 200 millimeters. Because, well, if you did, and you wanted a fast response, how, what are you going to do about the overshoot? You can't have it go shooting past where it's supposed to be and then oscillating back and forth until it's, you know, in the right place. That would be daft. Similarly, you don't really want to see your robot <laughs> responding to um, the loss of a wall, right? When it's following a wall, you don't really want to see it flapping around whilst the response settles. We don't do that. What we do instead is we provide profiles, that is, step changes, small step changes in distance, and those are how we drive the robot on a fixed speed. So if we want to go 100 millimeters per second, then every hundredth of a second, we can move it on by just the one millimeter. These are small amounts, right? So the important thing is, although the responses are important to, to describe the system, they're not a good way to test it. Now, plenty of people do. I, you know, I know some, some very well-performing robots who actually test their controllers by simply sitting the robot down and then just giving it a poke. Um, and seeing how it responds. Does it oscillate back and forth? Does it sort of sit and sulk? Or does it just stay where you've poked it to? I would suggest this is not the best way. But what happens when you come to 
try and work out what are appropriate values for these control constants, KP and KD. You, if you, you know, just sort of sit and um, poke in some values and see what happens, what if they're horribly wrong? You don't really want your robot suddenly shooting off the bench or running into the cat or going up in smoke or destroying the gearbox, right? So you, you, don't, you can't just poke odd values in and see what happens. So you, you turn back to everybody's friend, um, Google, or DuckDuckGo, or whatever is your, your fancy, or that control systems test book that you, you had from many years ago and never read, uh, and you find out how to tune your controller. And you will discover that there are some intense and scary mathematical techniques available to you involving graphs the like of which you'd never see. And there are some slightly more empirical methods, um, and you will come across one of the one of the four methods that you're most likely to come across is a thing called Ziegler-Nichols, um, where you you um, make measurements of the performance of your system and then do some maths on those measurements uh, and and derive some controller constants. Unfortunately, they're not suitable for what we're doing. Um, all of these techniques require skill and experience to apply well, and quite often they require an intimate knowledge of what's going on under the hood inside the system, right? The behavior of it the, um, and how things can work. And even worse, as with so much you look up on the internet, it's domain specific, right? You want to solve problem A. Somebody else has solved a problem that looks like it, but it's for domain B. It's something different. And you think, well, never mind. It sounds about right. I can apply that. To and you can't. Okay? It just doesn't work quite that simply, unfortunately. So what can you do with tuning? Well, let's have a look. Let's go back to the controller. Uh, which I've lost. Right. Let's just reset everything. And down here, you can see I have a little box for KP and KD. Now, hands up if you've ever looked up on the internet how to tune a motor controller or a robot controller. Yeah, of course you have. And I'm willing to bet that one of the early things that you come across is something like, well, start off by setting the value of KP to 1 and see how it responds. All right, let's do that then, shall we? KP is 1, KD is 0. We're going to use no feed forward, only the controller. Uh, and we'll just, just in case it comes back exactly where it's supposed to. Uh, we'll set it up and see how we go. Anybody got any predictions? Mm. Mm, nothing, because I forgot to write the new values in. We'll try again. <laughs> well, what do you make of that then? It's actually not far off where it's supposed to be. That's encouraging. But I think we can agree that this is a less than ideal response. Okay. Um, first off, the motor voltage um, shot up and saturated at six volts, which is the most it can have. And then it immediately went back negative to minus four volts and then saturated again. And then just it became a, a bang, bang, forward, backwards controller in some desperate attempt to get control of this whole system. And then it pretty much failed. So um, what's the next thing they say you should do? Any suggestions? Uh, put KD in to, to try and pull it back. Oh, what, without even attempting to change KP? Oh, no, no, D divide, divide your uh, KP by 10 for a start. Divide it by 10? Yeah. Right. Yes, yeah. I think, you know, what you see is, is indicative of a system with too much gain, 
right? Because the, the error builds and it immediately runs out of steam. This is another reason why doing step responses is not a clever way to do this. Um, and this could, in principle, have shot your robot across the room. Not to mention the fact that suddenly switching between plus six and minus six volts isn't doing your drivetrain any good at all. So I'll remember to write the results out this time. And we'll move it again. Oh, we'll just, just in case. <clears throat> Well, oh, that's not so bad, right? I mean, it's overshot, um, but the response looks like it might be having maybe the right kind of shape to it. Um, not very impressed by the motor voltage that's being generated. This dotted line, by the way, is what the feed forward controller thinks you should have to do for this profile. Uh, and a good indication, by the way, that we've got a good controller is if the controller generates something very similar to what the feed-forward controller does, because the feed-forward controller knows what the voltages should be, right? So that's an improvement. So what, what do we do now? Do we move KP larger or smaller or leave it as it is? Slightly smaller, would I thought. bit less? All right. Well, half? Uh, point, uh, point 0.8. Point 0.8, right. just a bit less. Just a bit less. Write that out. Hmm. It's hard to say if that's really an improvement. In fact, it's even harder to say if it's getting better. Let's carry on moving it down in the same kind of step. I, I, you know, it's hard to say that this is an improvement, right? It's not saturating, but it is getting way up to six volts. So maybe it's still too big. So let's make it properly small and see what happens then. Look at that. <laughs> it's not even clear that making this bigger or smaller is a definite improvement, right? Um, so now, having sat, typically, right, you'd be sitting there with this new controller, this new robot and your software, and you're, you're bouncing it around the room, and you're thinking, what do I do, right? Nothing I do with changing KP seems to make any difference. And what is absolutely certain is that none of this matches the experience that you see in all those helpful tutorials on the internet. None of it. So you think, oh, well, maybe I'll just, or maybe I'll mess with KD, right? <laughs> See if that makes a difference. <laughs> what are we going to do with KD? How big should we make KD? Come on, make me an offer. Uh, tenth of the KP value. Uh, okay, 0 0.001. Write that out. That's actually encouraging. So maybe we'll make it bigger. Not that big, maybe that big. Oh, starting to approach the right shape now. And look, the motor drive voltage is starting to look a little bit better. Let's just set this to my zero point, increase it a bit more. Write it out, run it again. This is very encouraging, right? I'm just gonna, I'm gonna see if I can go too, too far, right? Because a good approach for these things when you're searching for a number is a binary search. Um, but, so we'll just, we'll double that. Write it out. Well, by the way, did you note it came back to the zero point? Um, and now we're starting to get somewhere. We're getting what might be an acceptable response. And remember the, from the previous talk that if you use feed forward as well, then that can make up for a bad controller, right? So I'll add in, I'll do full control and I'll use both feed forward and feedback 
And that's pretty good. Right, we'll just see how accurate it is. That's not bad. Now the question is, is it good enough? Would you stop here? Well, if you don't stop here, how do you know how far to go? Because it, imagine this wasn't a wheel stuck on the bench, but this was your robot. It sounds okay, and you'll see what I mean by that in a moment. It sounds okay, and it gets to pretty close to where I want it to be. And I could maybe excuse myself in having got some other constant slightly wrong, and so this might be acceptable accuracy. And so you might think, well, this is fine. I can stop with that. I mean, the, my point is, what are your criteria? How do you know you've got a decent response or not? Well, we won't answer that because that's partly subjective. But let me just show you something interesting. <clears throat> Let's turn off the feed forward. Set the KB to be 2. And I'll set KD to be 0.1. And I think we can agree from our experiment that these are perhaps ridiculous numbers, right? But imagine now that you you don't have the, 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 the application, you don't have the telemetry, you have a robot set on the ground. And you've put in these numbers from dabbling around at random, and this is what you get. I'll write them out. Listen, listen on the mic at this time. Right, so I got a very nice looking response. Even the telemetry looked good. And it stopped, cock on where it's supposed to stop. Is this a good controller? No, not even slightly. Look at what's happened to the poor motor. It's being bashed about. Like there's no, this isn't going to live very long. And you can hear it compared to what it was before. You can hear that this is not a happy system. But if this was your robot on the ground and you were following some naive tutorial on YouTube, you go, that's it, I've cracked it. Right? The robot does the right speed, it ends up in the right place, job done, move on. But I'm suggesting to you that you're just inviting a disaster down the road. Right, so the point is oops experimentation is no way <laughs> to design a good controller you can easily be misled and even do damage whilst you're doing it it may look good but that doesn't mean it is good uh, and by the way, the sound thing is is quite um, a good clue. If it doesn't sound smooth and, you know, I was going to say BMW-like, but that would be silly, um, then it, it probably isn't, right? If it sounds like a Trabant, it's not a BMW. So, and you can be deeply misled because if you don't have access to the right tools, what you see is not necessarily a good indication of how well the thing's going. So the question then is, all right, so I've led you this far. Hopefully, I'm going to tell you something about how to get reasonable values for KP and KD without going through this hell. And remember I said that this was a second-order system that we're dealing with? Well, the equation at the top, which is no fun, I'll grant you, is a normalized second order system. It's actually the same equation, but with the group with, as we saw before, but with some of the terms all joined together. And now in here, you can see these two controlling parameters, zeta, the damping factor, and omega n, the bandwidth. And 
this G here represents the fact that we're dealing with an approximation, right? I've just, I've simplified the model to the point where some things are not really true, right? It, this is just, so if you know better, just keep quiet. Uh, there, there are some nasty little approximations going on in here. But if you compare this with the bits in the previous horrible equation, and this with the bits in the other previous horrible equation, you, um, and I've, this is all in, going to be in notes, um, then you can rearrange things so that you can get two expressions, one for Kp and one for Kd. And these are in terms of the damping ratio. And here I've written Td, the settling time, all right? Remember, I referred several times to the amount of time it takes for the response to get within 5% of the desired steady state value. That's, uh, and we'll call that the settling time. And the good thing is we know Tm and Km because we took the trouble to measure them earlier. And so all we have to do is to pick values for zeta and Td. Now, you may reasonably say, okay, this is great, but you've swapped one problem for a different one, right? First of all, I had to find values for Kp and Kd. Now I've got to find values for zeta and Td. But what I'm suggesting to you is that zeta and Td are more intuitively obvious, right? Zeta is the damping ratio and tells you how quickly it settles, whether it overshoots, whether it doesn't overshoot. And TD tells you how quickly it gets to within the final specified value. These are much more intuitive numbers than KP and KD, which interact horribly and can give you slightly weird looking results anyway. So let's go back to the toys. Uh, there. And there. Just going to reset everything back to its defaults. And now we can try and uh, get a response by messing with the damping ratio and the settling time. Now, of those damping ratios, I said that there were some, some interesting values. And one of them, which was the one that got the fastest um, response within 5%, was to have the damping ratio at 0.7%. 07, right? Well, just in case you were asleep, that's what it was. Now, what makes a, a reasonable settling time, right? The, the time required for the system to get to within this steady state. Well, we know that a first order system, which is what the motors are, would take four or five, well, four time constants to get within 5%. Right, that's four times 325 milliseconds, which is very slow. So suppose we want we want to be ambitious and say, well, we actually want it to get to within its steady state in one time constant. Seems reasonable. So I'm going to now go for a damping ratio of 0.707, uh, a settling time of 0.325. And this gives me a value for Kp of 0.0474. I forgot to write down the values that we had before, sorry. And Kd of 0.0034. I'll write those out. Check that we're only using the controller. Do the move. And then we have a response. And this is a pretty fair response. In one go, from a few simple sums without wrecking the thing and shooting it over the room and killing the cat. Is it the best we can do? Well, maybe not. What, looking at this output, what, how would you describe it in terms of, you know, what, what could be improved? Let's have some suggestions. Anybody, don't make me point and nominate. <laughs> well, I just think it's lagging. It's, it's lagging, lagging, isn't it? Right? It's clearly not responding as fast as we would like. So, so let's reduce the settling time. Sound fair? Yeah. 
Let's make it. Let's make it half. Or pretty much half. Write that out. Reset my pointer. Because I'm always optimistic. Oh, that's not bad. Two trials, one set of sums, and I have what looks like a pretty good controller. The motor out, the actual drive voltage quite closely follows what the feed forward controller thinks would be needed to get the job done. And remember, we can always make things better by adding in some feed forward, so let's do that. Ah. A good indication that you've got stuff right with your, with your combination of feed forward and control, you may recall, is if the controller in is here shown in a fetching magenta um, actually doesn't have very much work to do in order to correct for the deficiencies in the, in the feed forward. Um, in case you're overly fussy, you might want to try and make it faster still, but you may recall that I said there could be a problem with that. So let's halve the response time again. Whoops. <laughs> Don't get carried away. Okay. We'll write that out. And now I want, I'll want i turn off the feed forward so we're only seeing what the controller's doing. And I want to um, see how an even faster response might be possible. So just bear in mind, just bear in mind the shape. Oh, actually, let's um, just go back. We'll go back to the 0.162 we had, turn off the feed forward, do the move, and have a look at the motor. Right? This is what the motor out output is, and it's also because we're only using the controller, it's what the controller says. So now I'll reduce this to um, 0 0.1, no, 0 0.08, oh, perhaps. Write it out and run it again. Hmm. I get a good response, but we're back to having craziness in the output. So there's a limit to what you can do. You, I mean, that should be perfectly obvious, right? You can't expect the poor thing to have an instantaneous response <laughs> to whatever you ask it to do. And the reason for that, predominantly, is because there's only so much oomph available from the, the drive system. There's only so many volts available, or if it, depending on your battery, there may not be enough current available to, to generate the torque needed. Okay, So you have to kind of draw the line somewhere. Um, so we'll just put this back to what we decided was a, um, a reasonable value. Whoops, didn't write it in. You hear the difference, by the way. It's much smoother, right? You can tell by listening to it. Uh, and now we've got our response. Um, I'm just going to drop the control voltage down to 6 volts, the motor supply voltage, and run it again. And the, the result's almost indistinguishable, right? Just, just to demonstrate. And the acid test, or should I say the cotton bud test, if I load it up again with my industry standard cotton bud, oh, hang on. I might as well give it a fair crack of the whip and put the voltage back to seven. <clears throat> it doesn't much care. There is a difference. Um, you'll notice, because I was pressing quite hard, you'll notice that it, it had trouble at the beginning um, because it just didn't have enough juice to overcome that friction. So again, there's a limit to what you can expect out of your controller. So, 
that's been a fairly long journey. Oh, I don't know, 45 minutes maybe. Um, here's the deal. If you want good control, you need a feedback controller. You can't do it with open loop. These can be difficult, if not impossible, to tune well. And even if you've tuned them up, you don't really know you've done a good job. Not without careful inspection and careful thought. But it's possible to jumpstart the process by making some fairly simple calculations on parameters which I would argue are a bit more intuitive. Parameters like you know, the overshoot and the settling time rather than these mysterious KP and KD which don't, you don't know anything about. And then just for the icing on the cake, add in a bit of feed forward and you should have a perfectly good controller. And the aim of the calculations, remember, is to make a good enough controller, not a perfect controller, because that's perhaps a crazy idea in the first place, but a good enough controller. And then feed forward fills in the gaps and away you go. Now, I spent <laughs> quite a long time preparing this, not long enough because I would like to get it down to about half an hour, but, you know, you can't win them all, can you? Right, okay. So let's um, get back to the camera and take any questions. Questions for Peter? It looks to me it can't be that simple. I thought that. I, in fact, when I um, the control, I, oh, I meant to say on the on the final slide that this control scheme uh, is exactly what's in the, the how the numbers come about in the in the maze runner code. The um, in my robots up until then, um, I used uh, a kind of um, control scheme called uh, a phase lead controller. And the reason for that was that I um, I got the idea from Dave Alton originally, and then talking with uh, Harjit Singh. Uh, and the reason for using them is that there is a closed form solution. That is to say, there are equations that you can fill in that give you controller parameters. It's uh, a phase lead controller is actually a PD controller with a low-pass filter on the detail. Uh, and we can talk another time about why you might want that. But it makes for a very nice controller for this kind of application. Uh, and I, all the time, for the last, I don't know, 15 years or so, that's what I used because I knew how to do it. I didn't necessarily want to do all the derivation, but I did know that I could follow these steps and get numbers that I could plug into my robot and get adequate control. Um, and then, I don't know really, I think it was um, when I did the, the feed forward thing, I thought, oh, I'll go back and re-examine um, the, the business of, of making a good enough controller because I had said somewhat glibly that all you need is a good enough controller and, and the feed forward will help. And then I, I started to think, well, really, what does that mean? And um, sat down, used up quite a few pages of scribble paper um, and came up with this scheme, which is a bit of a fudge. And I had the exact same response. This surely can't be this. Why have I never had this described to me before? Why has nobody ever suggested that for this particular kind of controller it would be possible to work out adequate, if not ideal, values for KP and KD. I have no idea. Um, but I, I was so unsure that I, I sent the paper to a couple of people and said, well, have a look at this and, and tell me if I've just been a complete idiot. And apparently not. So that's good. Yes. Okay. I've got a query about KD. Yeah. Uh, I'm assuming your differential term is the change in error between samples. Yes. Where does the sample rate appear in your calculations? I'm glad you asked me that. Um, let me just slip back to the slides. 
Right, so when you come to implement it, um, this is the equation that you're implementing. So U of T um, is the output from the controller. KP and KD we know about. E is the error term, which here is calculated um, elsewhere, right? It's, it's the difference between where you are and where you want to be. Oh, and by the way, I should point out that this is the exact same scheme that you would use for steering against the wall or for steering the robot along a line or, or whatever. It's the same thing. Uh, and in the control loop, the first thing you do is calculate the change in error, delta E, the error minus the old error, store the old error, um, and you're good to go. And the, mathematically, the equation is this, right? It's E of T minus E of T minus, uh, T minus 1 divided by DT. That's what it really is. And so DT is the sample time or the loop time. So you can do this several ways in the, in the code. Um, you could divide by the sample time in the actual loop, right? But division is expensive. So instead, you could multiply by the sample frequency. That's much faster. Or better yet, you can pre-multiply your value of KD by the sample time during the configuration so that, in fact, what you would see, um, and I can, I'm done with these now. Uh, let's just switch back to the camera. Um, I can't shovel these on the screen at once. Um, so that what you would actually see um, in your code is not a value of, what did I get here, uh, 0 0.007. But in this case, because my, my sample frequency or the, the system loop frequency is 500 hertz, I'd see 500 times that. So I would have a KD value of 3.5. But yes, it's a, it's a very, very good point that I meant to make earlier. The, this, this KD is, is a mathematical quantity, uh, and you will find that you, you must remember that uh, the sample time. Now, there are constraints on your sample time. If you make it infinitely short, uh, your change in error is always going to be zero. And if you make it you know, larger than the response time, so that um, the error can have done all kinds of weird things between samples, you're going to get an aliasing problem. Do you have any guidelines for choosing your sample rates? Um, if you anticipate, whatever you anticipate the response time of your system to be, and we've seen that we can we can d handle settling times of around about uh, 160 milliseconds. So long as, um, well, there, there are two things. One is, uh, for most digital systems, you really want to be running at 10 times um, your, your maximum system frequency, right? So uh, you also obviously don't want to run out of horsepower in your processor, so that can be a constraint. Um, uh, the little 80 mega isn't running out of horsepower at this, but you wouldn't really want to run it at one kilohertz, for example. Mm -hmm. um, and the other thing is, because the system has very low resolution encoders, if you make your uh, sample time too short or your, or your loop frequency too high is the same thing, then you, from one loop to the next, you may have recorded no change in distance. And so, and then several samples later, you've got what looks like a huge change, right? And this is why um, the phase lead controller is good because it has that low pass filter on the, on the D-term. And it's also why when you try and get better performance out of this particular robot, you discover that you run into problems and the, the controller voltage starts bouncing around all over the place because PD controllers notoriously are susceptible to noise generated in the data. So it's a compromise, but um, it, it's probably not worth worrying about what happens in the limits. It turns out that there are practical constraints over what your um, control loop frequency is going to be for the robot um, and you have to make things work for that. So for example, um, the, the UK Mars bot, 
has a top speed of maybe with a standard gearbox of maybe about 1.6 to 2 meters per second um, uh, at 500 hertz control and that would be three or four millimeters of travel um, and I really wouldn't want to be going much further than that between control updates um, so that's that's kind of where I get the numbers from I could have you know, ease the load by making it a 100 hertz control rate, but then I'd have been traveling 16 to 20 millimeters, um, and you, you can't afford that much movement between updates. So those those are more important numbers, and then you have to find encoders and, and other things that will make all that possible, I, I would suggest. I have uh, another query. You've got these magic numbers which you've measured in terms of the um, the response time and, if you like, the, the general motion of the thing. Yeah? And you've done those for straight line motion. Now, unless the inertia of the motors dominates, surely those constants are going to be different for rotational motion. Yes. Um, I, I have a scheme where there is a controller for forward motion and a controller for rotational motion. Um, so you run two separate PD controllers? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, it's not by any means the only way to do it. Some people resolve the forward and rotational motion into individual wheel speeds and they control those. I, I find it um, easier to handle in my head if I'm thinking separately about forward and rotational motion and then I can bind them at the last minute into wheel drives. But you, you have a problem with your... Um analysis because the two amounts of inertia are different yeah, yeah that's so I didn't, it. I didn't say I like it right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I'm aware I have seen code and I've seen people who control the, the wheels separately and there are complications with that yeah. thank you anybody else questions for Peter They're all assimilating it, I think. <laughs> I appreciate it. Um, <laughs> it's a lot of stuff, right? Um, yeah. And like like a lot of these things, really, you can, um, uh, to an extent, you can afford to look at the beginning and look at the end and throw out the stuff in the middle. Um, but what I hope to have done is to demonstrate that, you know, with the experimental setup, that this is real, right? It's not something... Sure. No, I, you know, I thought it was modelled. Um, I thought it was and, really useful. Okay. And I have um, I have a paper which I need to edit, um, which describes the derivation for those if anybody cares. Right. Um, and um, in due course, not wishing to commit myself to any more procrastination than is necessary, um, in due course I will put the whole thing up probably on um, the UK Mars uh, GitHub, um, and that's the the application that you see the controlling. Um, dashboard thing is that's a single Python file, so you should be able to run that on anything. Um, and all you need is a, in fact, the robot's just plugged in with an ordinary serial cable. You could do it over Bluetooth. Yeah. I haven't done it because I, I ran out of time, but there's no reason in principle why this wouldn't be a Bluetooth connection to a robot on the ground and you can actually do the forward and rotational motion and see what happens. I chose to do it static on the bench because it's kind of tricky to follow with the camera. In a yeah. Way. yeah. Uh, Duncan? As it happens, I was introducing a D term to my warriors on Tuesday last. And I had to explain it non-mathematically. Obviously, they're only 12 and 13 year old boys. So I had to think about it. And for the first time, I think I understand it now. <laughs> I've only been doing it for 20 odd years, but now I think yeah. I understand it. <laughs> Some, sometimes it's about perspective, but the, the other thing that, that may have helped crystallize stuff in your head is not so much this as just the fact that you've had to describe it to somebody else who knows nothing about it. And that mm -hmm. always makes that yeah. does wonders for your own understanding. Well, it, it, we're doing line following, obviously. And the difference between the P term, the P term tells you where you are, the D term tells you the angle to the line. Okay. Which means you can start, as soon as you're aiming towards the line, 
you can take your foot off the pedal even if you haven't reached it yet. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. You can you can describe the P term as describing the present, and the, and the D term as describing the, the future. Right, the, the D term is predicting what's going to happen um, and trying to do something about it rather than waiting until it has. Okay. Anybody? Anybody else? I, I can I can only say that um, my first effort with um, Asimov's, which had lots of good logging in it meant I could embarrass myself with my own controller and see what my motors were doing, um, which is probably why I had to replace several motors um, over time. They didn't die immediately, but they certainly died uh, more quickly than you'd want, and that was simply because they were being, well, they were just being pulled up and down um, all the time trying to control the thing. Uh, and that, although it looked okay, it was actually uh, really stressing the motors out. Uh, evidence by my replace rate. <laughs> There's, uh, there are, just checking my notes, there's a couple of caveats I should mention. One is you will see in one of the slides that um, you can't make the settling time too long or you get a negative value for KD, which won't work, right? So you can't stretch it out forever. Um, this is all because these are, these are nasty hand-waving approximations. Um, and the other is if you've got a very... Uh, lightly loaded system, right? So I have another test system where I don't have the big inertial load on it. I've just got an ordinary wheel, and that's uh, and the dominant uh, factor there is the, the inertia of the motor. Um, you may find that you simply can't get, you can't use small damping ratios um, because the, the system needs some controller damping because there's nothing else slowing it down. If that makes any any sense at all. Okay. So, but for the kinds of uh, applications that we have, which is wall tracking, line following, uh, and controlling the rotational and forward motion of, of robots of this kind of size, this will get you in the right ballpark. Can I ask a question on your, your simulation? You said you put the bigger wheel on to make the inertia the similar to the actual robot. Well, how did you, yeah. how did you estimate that? Uh, I added weights until it came out right. All right. Fair enough. <laughs> I mean, is it roughly speaking the same way to the robot or half the way to the robot or something? Um, I don't know. It's uh, the um, the equations say that if I remember, I can't remember, I can't remember. The the gearbox reduces the inertia by a factor of the square of the gear ratio. Um, so you need, I think it's the square. So you need, you know, like like. Um, four times the, the, the load at the other end of the gearbox. Um, and the inertia of a disc is um, mr squared, where m is the mass and r is the, the radius. So um, if you double the radius for a uniform disc, if you double the radius, you get four times the inertia. So um, you get your best results by having a big wheel. Plus it shows up better on the camera. If you if you tried to make, add weight to um, a, a 32 millimeter UK Mars bot, you'd have to make it out of solid lead to replicate the mass. Right. Okay, thank you. Anybody else? Done. Peter, thank you. Excellent.